Greetings and welcome to the Department of Tangents podcast. I'm Nick Zeno, your host, and this week I'll be speaking with another super hyphen of a guest, author, actor, comedian, writer, director, academic, person who is very scared at horror movies, Nate Dern. Dern has a new book out called Not Quite a Genius. It's a collection of humor pieces, both fiction and nonfiction, reflective and silly about everything from his days as a beauty and the geek contestant to vampire hot yoga. Uh, We spoke about the book and writing in general. Dern has written some extraordinarily silly stuff in the book, but there are also moments of reflection, more personal moments, and some downright terrifying stories. Dern has made a few of these pieces into short films to promote the book, uh, and if you check back on the Department of Tangents blog in October, you'll be able to see one of those films as part of our second annual Daily Horror Film Fest, when I'll be posting short horror films or trailers uh, from feature-length films all month. Dern counts Philip K. Dick and Kurt Vonnegut as literary influences, and that might give you some idea of the range in this collection. Dern is a senior writer at Funny or Die. He's acted in commercials and on TV shows. He's a former director of the Upright Citizens Brigade Theater in New York. And on top of all of that, he's working on a dissertation for Columbia so he can break into teaching. Uh, We touch on all of that in this conversation. And after the conversation, I have a treat for you. I have a new song from next week's podcast guest, Corinne Ashley. So stick around for that if you like well-constructed power pop. And now, Nate Dern. So about Not Quite a Genius, 14 out of 46, I, I believe, of these pieces were previously published. So this isn't a this isn't a collection of stuff you already had lying around. How did you put this together? Yeah, so I, a few years ago, I uh, I read a book by B.J. Novak uh, called One More Thing, Stories and Other Stories, and it's a collection of humor pieces, and I really loved it, and it inspired me to put together in a Word document just all of the humor pieces that I had written over the last decade or so, mm-hmm. either on my own, um, and some that I'd submitted to places and some that I hadn't, um, just kind of out of curiosity to see how much I had written, because I wasn't quite sure. Uh-huh. And once I put it all together in a document, uh, I just looked at the word count and realized, well, I've, I've written enough, more than enough, uh, just in terms of quantity for a book, which isn't to say it was the quality of a book, but it was uh-huh. just nice to see, okay, this is long enough that it could be a book. So then I uh, cut the pieces I didn't feel as good about and sent that off to my uh, manager who helped me connect with the book agent. And then from there, the book agent gave me some feedback and then we sent it off to some publishers and then got started working with an editor for a few years. Uh-huh. Uh, who gave me feedback and had me write some new pieces. Um, so all of the nonfiction personal essays that are in the book are new as of uh, input from the editor. So those mm. were all that he pieces that he had encouraged me to write and put in the book. Mm. Oh, so none of those had been, uh, you hadn't been writing those until you started the book? Correct. Well, that, that, that's one of the interesting parts of this book is is that you know, a lot of comedy writers seem to be sort of pursuing a niche for themselves. They want to be a David Sedaris style or New Yorker style essayist or write odd shorter pieces or write short stories. And there are a lot of different voices uh, in that collection. Uh, did did you, what made you put all of the different parts of the, the this together rather than focus on one particular niche of, of writing? Yeah, I think part of it was uh, to try to make it more varied and interesting, um, mm-hmm. since I enjoy all of these different styles and uh, formats. And then it was also just a um, sort of trying to create something that might be <laughs> might be able to keep people's attention spans a little better. So there's some very short pieces uh, mixed in with some of the longer pieces. Mm-hmm. Um, and then also recognizing that um, sort of a, a reality of, of publishing is that uh, memoir tends to do better than strictly humor. P- 
pieces. Uh-huh. And so sometimes if your book is only just straight humor pieces, they might put it like in the joke book section of the bookstore. So your your book could end up next to like 501 funny toilet jokes or something like that. Uh-huh. Uh, whereas if Not you that there's anything wrong with personal it. essay pieces in there, then it might end up, you know, like you said, next to a David Sedaris, which is uh-huh. hopefully a little bit more of the the world I would want it to be <laughs> to be in. <laughs> uh-huh. Let me do you want is there a niche that you want to pursue as a as a writer is there a type of piece you'd like to be known for yeah well i didn't up until working on this i didn't think that i did want to be known for the personal essay um but i've actually really enjoyed that uh much more than i thought i would and since working Mm -hmm. on it um in the in an attempt to get my name out there as a writer a little more in the last really in earnest in the last year I've tried to start publishing more um, first person essays and so I've, I've written a couple pieces for Outside Magazine um, mm. and then also for New York Magazine and for Vice where I've gone out um, and in a few cases like I've pitched an idea and then gone and done it or have retroactively written on something um, and then a couple, in a couple cases was asked to go do something, you know, so assigned a topic, mm-hmm. which was fun to do. So I think actually, um, I'm looking to continue to do that. Mm-hmm. And so trying to figure out that world a little better, which is still new to me mm-hmm. of pitching to magazines or journals, mm-hmm. uh, a bit more essays. Were you resistant to the idea at first? Why, why wasn't, why wasn't I, it something you had I, pursued before? Yeah, I was, I was resistant. Um, I think, I do, you know, I love David Sedaris so much and uh, some other uh, first person essayists. Um, I just think are so talented and also have read such, in- uh, excuse me, have led such interesting lives uh, like Augustine Burroughs, I really love as well. And I just, I was worried of, of coming across as, you know, as like navel gazing or of thinking that I was so interesting that other people should read about me. Um, and so it's been a fun challenge to try to write in a way where it's not about, you know, just saying, look at me, look how interesting I am. That that's <laughs> not the focus of the piece and figuring out how you can do that with the essay. Well, that was the, uh, that was the, the first essay in the book was the, the sort of look at right. me aspect of it. Did, did that come from, they're talking about you being on, uh, a reality show. Did that come from your sort of embarrassment of wanting to to write about yourself or, or your embarrassment of sort of being forced into writing about yourself? Yeah, de- it's def- definitely related to that, absolutely. Um, because it's a, yeah, it, like that essay talks about, it's a tendency that I know exists in myself, like the desire to, <laughs> to think that I'm so interesting and want people to look at me and get uh, validation or affirmation through that. Um, so I was reluctant to pursue the form because I, I was worried it might indulge a, one of my uh, uh, character traits that I'm not as proud of uh, as some of the others. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> Is it also sort of a, an effort to to address, yes, you have possibly seen me before on TV on, on Beauty and the Geek, and now we can we, we can dispense with that and get on with it? Yes, definitely. And that was part of the reason why to have that piece um, just because, so I, well, yeah, I was on the reality TV show Beauty and the Geek like a decade ago, and then I've been making comedy since then, and the comedy that I've made since then has quite a different voice than the voice of that show, uh-huh. um, which makes sense because I didn't create the show, I didn't make it or edit it or write it or direct it, I just happened to be on it, mm-hmm. and so sometimes people who, you know, were maybe like a quote-unquote fan of mine from that show would come and find like a piece of my writing or a, a video that I wrote. And I, I think sometimes they'd be disappointed because it was so unlike, um, you know, the piece of content they consumed in the reality show. Uh-huh. So yeah, it was a little bit of a, uh, not a warning, but a, but a, if, you know, if you came here knowing this person from that, here's, here's what to expect going forward. Uh-huh. But well, when you you were just sort of starting out in comedy when that happened, right? What was the timing of, of when you were pursuing comedy as a career and when you were on that show? Yes, yeah, so I was still a college. 
college student when I was recruited to be on that show, and I had just I had just been doing improv comedy and just starting to write, you know, satirical comedy pieces like short humor press. And it was just kind of dawning on me that maybe I would want to try to pursue it as a career once I was done with college. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I was working up the nerve to do that. So I think on some vague level, without really understanding how the industry works, um, I thought that being on a reality TV show, I thought that being on TV would help in some uh-huh. way, that that would somehow lead to something more legitimate for my comedy career. I, well, I could see how that would be either a confidence builder or possibly just destroy your, your confidence completely just from the nature of being in a reality show and, and what they might, how they might carve you up and present you. Yeah, it was, it was a little of both at times. Um, it felt, it was a confidence builder just like, okay, these TV professionals think that I'm at least not repulsive enough to be put on television that people would want to watch me. Um, but then, yeah, also, I think I realized, like, once it faded so quickly after the show, like, I, I you know, I, I had headshots made after the show, and I was like, okay, it's time, you know, the cavalry, cavalry will be here soon to whisk me off to Hollywood. Uh-huh. And then that just didn't happen, and a year went by, and then another year... And it just faded and faded. And so it was a good, um, even though it hurt my confidence, I think it was a good reality check and a good lesson that, you know, in, in like the entertainment business, there is no cavalry that comes for you. You just have right. to keep creating your own opportunities. Um, and except for very few people who are, unless you're like Brad Pitt or something, you, you have to, keep working for the next opportunity and keep hustling. By the time you actually started working in comedy, had the, had the, had the memory sort of faded uh, of the, the fact that you were on beauty and the geek or was it something like, you know, here's this reality star guy trying to get into to comedy. Um, it's still, it still nipped at my heels a little bit. Like I would, um, Usually, it wouldn't ever, people would would usually be polite and not say it to my face right away, but then I would, after I'd been like working with someone on a improv team for a while, they might be like, you know, by the way, I watched you on that show. Uh-huh. So then it would retroactively be like, oh, that's funny, for the last few weeks as, as we've been getting to know each other, you've been pretending <laughs> that you <laughs> didn't know that about me, or, you know, that sort of thing. And then every once in a while, like if I was doing a stand-up show or an improv show, uh, either before or after the show, there might be like a group of usually young women who had watched the show who would, uh-huh. you know, w- want to say hello and pose for a photo, but that's about it. Yeah, I, I could imagine that would be strange as well because then you, you're dealing with, with who they think you are. You've got to sort of yeah. guess who they thought, who the person they think you are how they interpreted you from seeing that right exactly uh how did you uh where where else did you decide to dip into your own personal life for the, for these essays how did you sort of get to a point where you decided oh this might be something i can i can mine for a print piece yeah well my editor um at simon and schuster ben lonen was hugely helpful so i you know i I think I made a huge list early on about all the inklings of ideas that I've, I've uh-huh. had to do something. And some of them were, you know, existed as stand-up bits or had kind of been funny moments or stories that I had performed at storytelling shows. Uh-huh. I had done some work on, like, finding the comedic take or what I thought was funny about it with some of them. Um and then he chose a few that he thought might be fruitful, and we wrote up, or I wrote up more than we needed. And then he gave me feedback on which ones to keep revising and which ones to cut. And in some cases, like the like, there's a piece about vege- trying to be a vegetarian that is um, sort of a smaller moment, like nothing, nothing too terribly interesting. 
mm-hmm. happens in that piece. Um, but I think it just, it like worked better as a piece than, for example, there were a couple, a couple stories that I wrote a first draft of that were more significant moments in my life. Like I was a, I was briefly a Teach for America teacher. Mm-hmm. Um, and I wrote an essay about that, but the, the essay, it was clear that it was, that I was still kind of grappling with, with that, uh, part of my life and that the, the essay just didn't really work as a piece. It was still too kind of raw. Hmm. Um, so yeah, it was a good, a good experience that, or a good learning experience, hmm. but the most kind of like the meatiest moments from my, from my life, at least initially didn't necessarily translate to automatically being the best essay. Hmm. Well, you had that filter already being a, a, a stand up and, and sketch performer where you would know the difference between what's a funny story at a party with at the office and what's going to be funny when presented to an a right. audience at large, which is a skill that I think many probably lack. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Which was, uh, which was useful in that process. A good, a good uh, realization like, oh, okay, I have, I have some applicable experience to this field. Hmm. I do like that, that, uh, when a piece starts in first person in this collection, I have to wonder for a few paragraphs. All right, is this Nate Dern or, or is this uh, a, a character yeah. that's being played? Usually, it's you know about the third paragraph; it'll make itself obvious. But that there's that disorienting first few moments. Yeah, which I like. I, I don't know how if all readers will like that, <laughs> but I do. I like that it makes you question. <laughs> <laughs> Well, how how often do you perform live? Um, well, I, I had been performing at least once a week in New York for the last, you know, many years. But then just earlier this year, I moved to Los Angeles mm. with Funny or Die, uh, the comedy website that I write for. They, they transferred me out here to their L.A. office. Uh-huh. And since I've been here, I've probably only been performing once a month. Um, this coming Monday, I'm performing with an improv group that, UCB called the Onslaught, which mm-hmm. is a team I've been performing with, um, but it's been a little more, uh, a little less frequent. Hmm. I mean, what is the uh, what is the office like at Funny or Die? What's the sort of daily routine there for being a, a senior a senior writer? That's for your position, right? Officially, your title. Yeah, my my current title, senior writer. Uh, yeah, it's wonderful. I really love working. There. Uh, it's a very fun and funny group of people. Um, most days start with a pitch meeting in the morning where we come in and usually talk uh, topical, uh, what's going on in the news or what's trending on the internet, and discuss a variety of joke ideas and the best format for them. Mm-hmm. So we're, the writers are responsible for all types of different formats. So uh-huh. we, can, we can write anything from a Twitter joke to a social image that would appear on Instagram and Facebook to a short video that uses existing footage and we just put in a new voiceover uh, all the way up to actual articles or actual new uh, sketch videos that we have to write and produce on a longer turnaround. Uh Um, So it's quite um, uh, schizophrenic (laughs) at times Uh because you have to be thinking in all these different ways. Um, maybe somewhat similar to the book that there's all these different formats that these ideas could appear in. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's fun. It's a very fun way to, uh, fun place to work. Is it the same kind of pressure of, of getting something out? Do you have to get something out today? Is it like a Saturday night live where you're thinking, you know, I've got to turn this 90 minute show around in a week, but you know, not the same pressure for a variety of reasons. We, we do create content every day, but we're, we're, it's nice because we don't have any set quota. So if we, if we only had one idea in a day, um, our, our programming team wouldn't be happy about it that we didn't create more, but it would be fine. Like our, the website would continue existing. Um, what we, so we're, we're, we have the luxury of, we only make the ideas that we feel good about. And if, if even if after we make something, we decide, you know, what, this didn't come together, we, we can not put it out online, which we do sometimes. Sometimes we make that call to not 
put it out. Whereas with something like SNL, like, you know, when it's Saturday at 1130, the shows has to go on whether they're ready or not. Right. You can't um, be like, there's only one good one sketch we wrote yeah, this week. Right. <laughs> Uh, one exception is that we do we make uh, branded content for our for our brand partners, mm-hmm. and that's a big part of how we pay the bills. And you know those deadlines are strict. And so if we if we have a video that is owed to Totino's Pizza Rolls, um, mm. when it's time for that video to be due, it better be done, and you know it better be good. What's what's that like to try to be funny for Tatinos? I mean, what what sort of direction right. do you get from from a company? It's a very interesting process because they um, most of the time uh, they don't know exactly what they want or they think they uh-huh. do, but they're um, they're they sometimes come to you and it's sort of vague what they actually want, um, and they're still figuring it out too. And then they usually have a lot of different requirements from a lot of different departments. Uh You sometimes get contradictory notes where, you know, the marketing team will be saying, well, we want to be edgy because that's our brand demographic. But then also their legal team will be telling you like, oh, no, it can't be. They won't use the word edgy, but they'll say like, well, you know, it needs to be uh, safe because of this and this. So you'll get like contradictory notes. Right. So you can't come in and say. You can't um, come in so and say, like... It's a fun balancing act of, of going back and forth, uh, uh-huh. figuring out what uh, what to create um, for them. And uh, hopefully you can create something that you feel good about, that you actually think is genuinely funny, mm-hmm. and that uh, checks all the boxes mm-hmm. the brand was looking for, too. Is that freeing in any sort of way? I know some people find boundaries kind of oddly uh freeing the the yeah sometimes it can be yeah because if there's no boundaries then it's you know infinite possibilities um like we just did a branded project with chiquita banana and Mm. for the they did an eclipse uh day thing where they in the parts of the country that where it wasn't a total eclipse Uh they were calling the sun a banana sun because uh, there's a sliver of sun still visible, so as if that was the official term, the banana sun. And they had already come up with that idea when when they were working with us. So we, the main concept we didn't have to come up with. They just wanted uh, our help in making a funny banana sun live broadcast on Facebook. Uh-huh. So with something like that, it's like, okay, that's the idea. That part's out of our hands. Now just how can we make this idea as funny as possible? Mm. So sometimes that can be a fun challenge, too. Is there a medium you prefer? You, you're you a writer, an actor, a, a, you do stand-up, uh, you've directed short films. Is there one you consider your main talent or calling? I do. Um, I'm lucky that I enjoy them all. I think part of it is I'm, I'm a very like project-based person. And when I have an idea that I'm excited about, I just want to work on that until it's done. So if I get like a short film idea, um, then I just want to work on that at the expense of everything else until uh-huh. it's done. Um, or if I have like an essay idea, I just want to work on that. Um, so I do, I like doing them all, which is probably a, a detriment <laughs> that I'm not just focusing on one and becoming a master at one. But I, I do like to keep switching it up. It keeps me interested. Mm, that's been a, that's come up in a couple of interviews lately where it, it can actually be a detriment to you to to have varied interests, to not define yourself, nail yourself down as this is what I am and then sell that. Yeah, I think that's true. I think that that, that can be true. Um, pe- you know, people, <laughs> when you, people want to kind of buy the story of you. And I think a lot of times, like when an actor tries to be a painter too, um, like Jim Carrey, I just saw a video on Vimeo of him trying to be a painter mm-hmm. and there'll be a backlash against it. Like, well, he couldn't possibly be a good painter because he's an actor. And like it, the stories that we have to tell are that you like, it, it breaks our mold that you could possibly be good at these two different things. And so mm-hmm. we, in these like subjective forms like painting or, acting we we say well no you can you couldn't possibly be a good painter um so i think that's part of it that you that this like the narrative because when you buy a piece of art you're also buying the narrative around
I'm the creator. Uh-huh. And you, you would, I think you want to think that they've slaved away at this one task to become good at it. And so they're worthy of your time to see what they've created. And any, any evidence that they're like spending time doing other things maybe, uh, hurts the suspension of disbelief that it's like a, a work of genius that you might be holding. Right. Oh, I think that, the, that, uh, Everybody wants to believe in sort of the effortless talent, but I think it's also an incredibly frustrating idea for people that that somebody like Tony Bennett might be a great painter as well. Right, um, right. But how do you decide what's a stand-up routine and what's a short film or, or what's a written piece? Is the line clear for you when you get an idea? Yeah, I think sometimes it's clear. Um, sometimes it's trying it at something. So I've been, um, like, I've been, I've been working on, uh, this, like, one idea that I, I thought was going to be, uh, that I thought was going to be, a, uh, an essay. And it kind of dawned on me recently, like, well, really the best version of this idea would be, like, a play, would be mm. a, a short play to really accomplish this. And then once you, so it's a little bit trial and error because I was trying to make it the essay and then like, ah, this isn't quite working and then sort of realizing, ah, this is, this is what it should be. So sometimes it's trying it as the stand up bit or trying it as a, a sketch. And then if it doesn't work, like realizing, oh, in order to achieve this, it needs, you know, some visual elements and maybe it's actually a short film or maybe it needs this and you can mm. kind of tweak it from there. Well, you did make some short films based on some of these pieces. Did you? Mm-hmm. Were they made before uh, you decided to release this book? I know one of them had a, I think, a time print of of 2015 on it. Yeah. Well, the so some the the first manuscript of the book that I turned in was three years ago, mm-hmm. um, and it's been revised a lot since then, and pieces have been cut, and new pieces have gone in. But the two, the two um, short films that I've made based on pieces in the book were existing uh, stories in the original manuscript. So they're older pieces that I I made the short films thinking that the originally the book was supposed to come out possibly two years ago, and then it was supposed to come out a year ago, <laughs> and mm-hmm. it, it kept getting pushed back for various reasons. Um, so I've had those films ready to go. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> to part of the reason I made them was to try to promote the book. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's so yeah, it was just delayed, delayed publishing process. So I have these, yeah, these short films with the older timestamp. <laughs> uh, well, it's interesting comparing the short films to the stories from the book. The way you you treat dialogue is different. For example, what seems realistic in print would seem uh, too wordy on film. Right. So it's yeah, cool. I'm also yeah. Part of that is I think maybe the director that I try to be, which is you know I have an improv background, so I like when actors improvise or try to make the words their own a little more. Um, I also am fond of giving actors dialogue that is somewhat unreal, <laughs> unrealistic or wordy, and you know seeing if they can make it feel real or i like the the way that that can sound sometimes huh well, yeah lack of sleep it's very much condensed mm-hmm. and there's some and the uh um i'm for i'm blanking on the name of it how many farts make up a life is that the uh that's right yeah <laughs> yeah that also turns both of those are are fairly dark in nature as well you know and lack of right. sleep is basically a horror short how do those fit in with the rest of the pieces here yeah i think um some of the pieces are quite light and fluffy but i think there's sort of a darkness i think there's a darkness in many of them um Mm -hmm. like the second piece is about a yoga studio that's also a vampire coven (laughs) right which is you know that's kind of silly but then i think it sort of turns that maybe uh one of the yoga attendees i think gets eaten at the end or it's implied that they might get eaten Mm -hmm. uh 
<laughs> by the bat demon. Um, and so I think even with the some of the lighter ones, I guess I have a dark sensibility, or I, I think that that's mm. like the line between humor and darkness, or humor and tragedy. I think you know, obviously, is a fun one to play with. Uh-huh. Um, but you're right; it's definitely more explicit in some of them. Hmm. I think I think I just mixed up uh, lack of sleep and this is a dream I'm going to kill you. Both of them are dark, but this is a dream and, and I'm going to kill you is the one that has a short film. Uh, oh, that's lack... what I thought you meant. Actually, even though yeah, that's what I heard in you... my head. Even though yeah, I think you said the other one, but yes, yeah. But the the, the lack of lack of sleep is, is is basically a horror short story. In, yeah. in this, I mean, are you a horror fan? Is that uh, is that something I, you enjoy? I am. I'm a, I'm a, relu- a reluctant horror fan where I <laughs> have someone see the horror movie ahead of time and tell me exactly where all the scary parts are. <laughs> and then I, I do love to watch it. And some of my favorite movies are horror movies or have a horror plant to them. And I've also, I'm working on a horror screenplay right now. Um, but I'm, I'm a, big wimp when it comes to horror movies <laughs> and I really get scared by them. <laughs> so I, I think maybe I have a, uh, that could be useful because maybe I have a, a, a very sensitive, you know, whatever, like a horror gag reflex is or something uh-huh. like that. Well, so maybe that could be useful. Um, but I don't, I don't see a ton of horror movies. Like I don't really particularly like slasher movies, for example. Uh-huh. But um, any well, horror movie that People say like, "Well, it was a horror movie. It was actually, you know, just like an overall good film." I'll go out of my way to see that. Too. Mm. Well, what makes you? What scares you in these films? Ooh, wow! So just the, um, I think maybe I just have an active imagination. So I, the ones that leave a lot to your imagination, anything that plays with darkness, <laughs> uh-huh. uh, just from that old childhood being afraid of the dark. Um, and I also, I grew up a Christian, um, so horror movies that have like a demonic or possession or religious or devil Uh element to them, I think probably taps into some childhood psyche thing I have going on as well. Mm -hmm. Well, the devil is sort of the, the new zombies, it seems. There's a new possession of sort of movie that comes out, it seems, every couple of weeks. Is that the the kind of right. film that you would yeah. that you watch mostly? Do you have any yeah. favorites? Yeah. Um, I think I I just saw I just re- I don't know if this is quite in that genre, but I just recently watched again the um the Dupl- oh excuse me someone's knocking at my door sure let me see what's going on um, I just recently watched the Duplass's. Uh, creep. Oh, that's fantastic! I love that. Yeah, which is I don't know if that's quite in that genre, but I I just really loved it, and it kind of um, I rewatched it because I'm inspired to try to write a movie like that. I would definitely call that horror. I think a lot of people try to if they think a movie is really good, they don't want to call it a horror movie. You're you're right. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but that has so such wonderfully intensely uncomfortable moments, like the the bathtub scene right up the, in the beginning of that. Yeah. Hello. How are you? Oh, thank you so much. Yes, I'm sorry. Thank you. Have a good day. Sorry about that. Our neighbor was neighbor was delivering mail that went to his place by mistake. Ah, well, that's nice. <laughs> that's okay. So, is it that sort of the uh, more psychological, uncomfortable moment kind of horror that, that that you prefer? Yeah, I love that. Any any horror that does a that psychological job of making you question your own sanity or what is real and what's not real, which I think Creep does a great job of. Of am I the crazy one, or or is is something really going wrong here, or maybe I'm imagining it? Maybe it's all in my head. Um, like the Babadook, I think does a great job of that yes. as well, where you kind of watch someone unravel 
and watch as they question their own sanity. And uh, yeah, I love I love that. What is real and what's not real? There's you know Rosemary's Baby has that, yeah. and it uh, the Stepford Wives is is pretty much a, a horror film along those lines, and and Get Out is very much in the oh yeah that same vein. Well, you you. Yeah. Lack of sleep has that sort of imagination thing to me because you don't know where it goes for, from then. To uh, just as a, a spoiler alert for anybody listening, the end of that, you know, there's a, a, a the premise is there's a, a guy who can't sleep. He hears banging from down the hall, and he goes to investigate, and it's basically God banging on a radiator, and <laughs> and, and telling him what what's the line? He said that that uh, you know how you're anxious and not very social uh do you remember the line that that god tells the uh yeah i think it's something like that and it lists all those adjectives and asks him to think well can you think of some reason why i would have made you that way yes and and, he so so he has to think what what that could be yes and 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 the reveal forward past a few seconds if you don't want to know the, the reveal if you're listening to this is you know can you God tells this guy, well, can you think of why God would have any use for a person like that? <laughs> and leaves them with that. He said, when you get, when you figure that out, you can get back to sleep. <laughs> Which is, uh, that, that is an insomniac's nightmare. Right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> to be left. That's the, uh, I know you thanked Philip K. Dick in the, uh, uh in the acknowledgments at the end, I, that seems like a big reason. You know, that seems like a Philip K. Dick moment to me. Yeah, oh, yeah. Absolutely. Thanks for saying that. I try to create some Philip K. Dick moments in there a few times. Uh huh. So yeah, I, I would. That's definitely something I would aspire to. You you, you thank a, a an interesting group of authors at the end: Kurt Vonnegut, Flannery O'Connor, Philip K. Dick, and George Saunders. At the end, do you aspire to, to write like th- that group of writers? Yes, absolutely. I think, um, yeah, those are my my favorite. And they, they each, I think, uh, you know, they've each written in the short story uh, mode. And I think they each have an element of like a sci-fi. I think Flannery O'Connor isn't usually thought of as sci-fi, but... There's, some of her premises have like a fantastical religious element that mm-hmm. I, I think to me borders on sci-fi or at least the premises that it introduces. And then Flannery O'Connor also has that, you know, undercurrent of darkness and also the religious themes mm-hmm. uh, that interest me of being damned or saved, uh, which I like a lot. Yeah, and, and George Saunders has that puzzling sort of mix of humor versus versus darkness. There's always something. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, he's kind of the master of it, of the stories that can kind of turn on a dime between being light and funny and then heartbreaking and tragic and all at once as well. Uh-huh. No, uh, I wanted to go back to the uh, the vegetarian story. Uh, quickly, that that short that story talk. That's one of your personal essays in here, uh, where it talks about how you vegetarianism was your thing for a while. Being a vegetarian was your mm-hmm. thing. Is that is that still your thing? Do you have a thing now? I'm trying trying not to have a thing because it was like a very <laughs> maybe a middle school thing to have a thing. I'm sure I do, and I just don't realize that I do, which, by, by having a thing, I guess I just mean, like, almost like an identi- identity crutch. Yes. Like, you need to, need to have something that you're like, well, this makes me interesting. Um, maybe being a comedian is my thing, or being a writer, or, you know, thinking of myself as that, is, has replaced me. That, that would be, that would be another one of those weird Kafka-esque holes to fall down writing about how writing is your thing right <laughs> and trying to Which i i like meta stuff like that it can be it can be tricky to not um 
yeah, fall too deep down that hole. But I, I like I like premises like that. Hmm. Well, they, there's a thread of that in some of the other stories of of people doing things that they think would make them look cool or, or trendy. It's in uh, I'm not an asshole. I'm an introvert, as well. Uh-huh. Is is that one of the bigger modern character flaws you see in, in people? Hmm. I think most of I don't know if it comes across this way, but most of the if I have, if a piece is ever critiquing something, it's usually because it's something that I in myself that I don't like. Uh-huh. <laughs> so I like with the introvert piece, I think of myself as an introvert sometimes um and but then i worry sometimes that i use being an introvert as an excuse for behavior that sometimes is just being an asshole or just (laughs) not being as considerate as i should be um but that that piece is the most hate or that piece got the most hate mail of any piece i've ever written (laughs) by far which is interesting to me because I think that that one was published on the, in the New Yorker Daily Shouts, and I think that folks who think of themselves as introverts thought that the piece was saying, um, or thought that I was trying to say that introversion wasn't real, or that all introverts were boring, or something like that. Whereas yeah. I, was, I thought I was trying to protect the, I was trying to say this is a real thing, and if you you know, ascribing behavior to this real thing that is not this real thing is problematic, but that's not how, uh, that's not how it was received by at least a lot of people. Um, but there's another piece about like making fun of man buns. That one's pretty white, but I, at the time when I wrote it, I had a man bun. So, you know, I was a part of the trend uh-huh. in Brooklyn. So a lot of the pieces that are <laughs> making fun of something, it's probably because I'm trying to like, exercise that part of myself that i Mm. uh, also have well it's it's funny because the in those are those those are pieces that skirt that line between being a first person essay and 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 more of a uh a a more distanced humor piece because the the people in those essays aren't necessarily you they're they're sort of a character which is yeah, I would think of those as fictional, but even though even now I'm saying that they're you know based on something real, mm-hmm. but I yeah I, I I see that though. Is there a larger social commentary to some of these? You 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 talk about uh, there's a, the anti-vax piece, uh, and, and I don't want to let this get away with me. Roger th- is a fantastic name by the way, one of the names of the oh. kids in that. Uh, and you talk about global warming. You talk about, there's the, uh, the politician who outs himself as right. a scientist in, in one essay or in one humor. This is, this is the difficulty. I'm saying essay and trying to, to figure out, is it an essay or humor piece or right, what to right. call it? But I don't, I, I use the ball interchangeably too. Um, yeah, definitely a larger social commentary with those. And I guess, yeah, that's, I take it back what I just said, that the critiques are always a critique of myself. Yeah, because the scientist one is just critiquing politicians who deny that global warming is real, <laughs> uh-huh. or who deny science. And then the um, the yeah, anti-vaxxer one is a pretty straightforward critique of anti-vaxxers. Yes, for, for people so, that just Yeah, those ones are more, I think, surface level. This is what it's talking about, and that's what it's about. Yeah, to explain that one, the, the anti-vax piece is uh, let me. I've got the book in front of me here. Get the so I don't get the title of it wrong. It's about a uh, a person who has seven kids, and only six of them have <laughs> whooping cough. I just want to try to get the the name correct. Only six of my seven kids have whooping cough, so I'm staying anti-vax. Is the title of, yeah. of that one? The premise being very clear from that, and you yeah, the, and that was inspired by a real article from a, a Canadian woman who seven of her seven children had whooping cough, and she was that was when she realized, you know what, maybe I was wrong about being anti-vax. So I thought it was funny that it took all seven that, and so I, if had only six, she would have doubled down on the anti-vax. Mm. 
And the, the scientists who named it Global Warming would like to apologize. That was in Funny or Die as well. And that's that's another one of those pieces. You're, you're taking on the voice of, uh, oh, is it Boker? What's the name of the uh, the scientist who cl- who coined the term? Of global oh, gosh. I don't, I don't remember right now. I should. Uh, hey, did you hear back from him at all? Did that reach him? One of his uh, grad students who uh-huh. said that he had seen it and liked it, uh-huh. <laughs> um, and that it also heard back from several people who said they were his grandchildren, who, um, with varying degrees of enthusiasm for the piece. No one was a hundred percent upset, but I think um, some because I use his real name. And yes. it's a real essay that, or a real, you know, uh, journal piece that I referred to where the phrase actually was coined or it's people say it was coined. Um, I think because he did a lot of other work in his life and uh-huh. some of, I think his grandchildren were saying that he would like to be known for some of the other work that he's done perhaps. <laughs> and so uh-huh. I think they just wanted to let me know he's, he's done other stuff too besides that. Hmm. What's some of the names you suggest here? Instead of global warming, the bad pollution hurt Earth effect <laughs> seems, seems like the most direct. The let's stop poisoning our grandchildren, please phenomenon. Yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes. Do you forget that you wrote these things sometimes and read back and think, oh, that's that's oh, actually pretty good? Ab- absolutely. I completely do, uh, which is fun. Yeah, especially when, because at Funny or Die, for, I'm... My main job, so I, is, uh, I oversee all of our articles, so all of our freelance articles, um, and then I write some articles myself. So every day I'm reading dozens of articles, dozens of humor pieces, and then writing, writing my own. And so sometimes what I've written can kind of just be uh, lost in the wash of all of that humor that I get to read and write every day. Uh-huh. So yeah, it's fun when I <laughs> am reminded of something I wrote and it almost feels fresh, like something that uh, someone else wrote. And sometimes right. it's like, oh, that's funny. That's a nice surprise. I'm kind of funny. And then other times I read something <laughs> that I've written and I hate it. And I'm like, oh my God, how did I ever think that was funny? Oh, get it away. Well, for, for the more personal pieces, how, how often do those come from just sort of a moment of, of reflection alone in a room somewhere where you just say to yourself, God, I'm so full of shit. Oh, that's gonna, that's an idea. <laughs> yeah, that, that happens. And I, I like to, uh, journal. So I have long hand will write in a journal. Um, yeah. And that's where they'll come from. A lot of times is, you know, feeling guilt or shame, embarrassment about something and kind of writing it out on the page. Um, and sometimes what's interesting to you about something um, won't be the most interesting thing to other people about it. So sometimes writing it a few times, you'll realize, oh, this this thing that I thought was just kind of a small part of it is actually probably more relatable mm-hmm. than this other thing that I'm that I personally have been harping on. But that's actually not the most relatable part of this. Uh-huh. I'm trying to figure that out. Again, it must have been strange to, to sort of pull back to the the beginning of this to have somebody who doesn't really know you say, "Hey, you need to have more personal essays in this collection." Yes, yes, it was it was interesting. Yeah, and I I thought a good uh, sort of a leap of faith on his part that uh, he might have said no to all of them had it, had they not worked out. But yeah, there wasn't he wasn't going on a whole lot to think that I would be able to do that or had something interesting. Right, it's like that. Uh, I don't know if you're a Dom Irera fan, and he has that whole routine from from years ago about how people used to tell him, "Hey, you know what you should do? You should be on The Sopranos." I'm like, "Oh yeah, I hadn't thought of that. I'll just <laughs> I'll just be on the most popular TV show." Great, Great idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, what's uh, what's ahead for you? Are you Work your you say you're working on more personal essays you've got yeah pretty kind of perpetually or at least for the time being I think I'll be working on essays um 
I'm writing one for uh, Outside Magazine right now. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I'm going to try to pitch a few others. I'm still working at Funny or Die every day. And then uh, I'm working on a dissertation at Columbia, trying to finish up a sociology PhD that oh. I'll finish this year. <laughs> that I've been chipping away at. Well, that's it. Um, where would where do you go with that once you have that? Is that just a, a personal fulfillment sort of pursuit, or? Well, if, yeah, I'm probably not a, at, at this particular moment. I don't think I'm a serious enough academic to really make a go of becoming like a professor at a top tier university. But I love academia and I love learning and I love teaching. So I am hoping to one day make it back to academia and teach again. Um, so I think I'll, you know, the long, long term plan is to work in comedy and writing and entertainment for a while and then <laughs> and back up at a college again. You're doing it completely backwards. You realize that, right? You're, you're working yeah. in comedy until yeah. your teaching gig comes through. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> is there a world less funny than academia? This is the job that that's you know that that moved you from New York to Los Angeles and and I'm assuming pay the bills uh, pays the bills so it's amusing that that uh, your your advisor tolerates that. Yeah, well, most I think at least in in the program I'm in, um, they I think academics PhD students are signing on to live a life of poverty or near poverty for a few years when you're just a teaching assistant Mm -hmm. and and getting, you know, a very small stipend for your, in return for your teaching assistant duties. Um, Or perhaps, I think I'm sure a handful of people who get PhDs somehow have family money or are supported by a partner or something like that. Uh And that's how they make it work. But yeah, I don't, for the most part, I think it'd be very tough to... Live, or it is tough to live on a PhD student's <laughs> salary. That's just that's sad. It, it, it you know if it's tough to make it on a with a PhD, right? You know, and meanwhile we're telling people stay in school, kids. You know? Yeah, I guess it's yeah. It's like a, the hope is you know after <laughs> once <laughs> yeah. you're done, then you make it back. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so uh, people can find out more about the the book and watch some of your uh, clips and keep up with what you're doing on natedern.com. Mm-hmm. And where else might they look for your yeah, stuff? Yeah, I'm on Twitter, on Twitter, at Nate Dern. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can find me on Facebook as well, Nate Dern. Okay. Oh, uh, and you have a a web series as well I forgot to ask about that's uh I'm the, the name is I didn't uh sorry I gotta go back to the name it's slipping me oh, the, that's all right. the uh the high school the student oh, body yeah. president yeah, yeah I, I didn't wrote for a show that's on go 90 uh that's called Mr. Student Body President yeah uh there's the first season is available online now, and the second season they're shooting right now. It should come out soon. Um, and it's on uh, Go90, which is Verizon's content platform. But mm-hmm. if you just Google Mr. Student Body President, uh, you should be able to find it. And it's sort of like a House of Cards type political intrigue show, but set in a high school. So it's student government that takes itself very seriously. Yes, yeah, so it was a 15 or 16 minute type uh, uh, episodes. Yeah, exactly. 
All right. And any place else to, to look? Anything else you want to mention? Um, I think, uh, yeah, just check out the book. If you like it, please give a review on Amazon or Goodreads. That's very helpful. And thank you for checking it out. Okay. Well, thank you for speaking with me today. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. I enjoyed it. Thanks so much for having me on. Oh, you're very welcome. An arrow to the head isn't always a trick. Thanks again to Nate Dern for speaking with me. Uh, you can find out more about him and keep up with his work at natedern.com, N-A-T-E-D-E-R-N.com. And now a track from next week's podcast guest, Corinne Ashley. Ashley is an accomplished singer, guitarist, and bass player. He writes guitar-driven power pop as well as anybody playing right now. He was the first guest to break in the new podcast kitchen at the house, and we had a wide-ranging conversation about the new album, Broken Biscuits, uh, Ashley's musical history, and his experience as a stroke survivor. It's good stuff, and I'm looking forward to you guys being able to hear that. Uh, And until then, this is Magpie Over Citadel from Corinne Ashley's new album, Broken Biscuits. Enjoy.
Dear Young.